Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome in the land of peace, the land of Amity, Sinai. Welcome in the third iteration of the World Youth Forum in, in a meeting that uh, takes place every year where youth from all over the world meet together to participate and to share humanity, peace, and um, friendship and to create aware generations for a better future. السيدات والسادة الحضور تشهد البشرية موجة مقلقة يتم استغلال وسائل التواصل الاجتماعي وغيرها من أشكال التواصل كمنصات للتعصب كما يتم استخدام الخطاب العام كسلاح لتحقيق مكاسب سياسية من خلال خطاب يوسم الأقليات والمهاجرين واللاجئين والنساء وأي شخص يسمى الآخر ويزيل عنهم إنسانيتهم وهذه ليست ظاهرة معزولة أو أصوات عالية لعدد قليل من الناس على هامش المجتمع يعتبر اليوم خطاب الكراهية كتهديد للقيم الإنسانية والاستقرار الاجتماعي والسلام ولهذا نلتقي اليوم في هذه الجلسة بعنوان مكافحة خطاب التطرف والكراهية على وسائل التواصل الاجتماعي وستناقش تلك الجلسة سبل التصدي لخطاب الكراهية والتحريض على العنف المتنامي على وسائل التواصل الاجتماعي والسياسات المقترحة لتغلب على انتشار التنمر الإلكتروني والممارسات العنصرية والتمييزية وطرق معالجة الأسباب الجذرية لتلك الظواهر سيشرفنا في هذا النقاش نخبة متميزة للغاية لمناقشة هذه القضية الحيوية ويسعدنا أن نرحب بهم صاحبة المعالي السيدة إيفلين بيتويي وزيرة الشباب والبريد وتكنولوجيا المعلومات جمهورية بوروندي صاحب صاحب السعادة السيد مرقوب سليم مدير التنفيذي للجنة الدائمة المستقلة لحقوق الإنسان في جدة منظمة التعاون الإسلامي أهلا وسهلا بحضرتك السيدة وفاء ساندي كاتبة صحفية وباحثة سياسية في شؤون الشرق الأوسط المملكة المغربية أهلا وسهلا بحضرتك السيدة أبو سعد رئيس منظمة مصرية لحقوق الإنسان السيدة أميرة عادلي صحفية من جمهورية مصر ليست إيجيبسيان En fait, cette séance est divisée en trois parties, deux parties pour les interventions et une dernière partie pour la question et les commentaires. Vous avez deux minutes pour les commentaires et nous commençons par Madame la Ministre Evelyne Poteuillet. Bienvenue, chère Madame la Ministre de Jeunesse et de Communication électronique. Que pensez-vous du rôle des réseaux sociaux et de l'informatique? que pour faire face euh, au discours de haine et que pensez-vous aussi de la plateforme des réseaux sociaux et qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire afin d'être de s'assurer que euh, cette plateforme est dépourvue de tout, tout discours de haine. Et permettez-moi d'abord, Excellence, Mesdames, Messieurs, les membres du gouvernement de la République arabe d'Égypte, honorables, distingués invités, chers jeunes, Bonjour encore une fois. C'est un plaisir de pouvoir participer à ce, forum, à ce forum des jeunes au nom du président de la République du Burundi, son Excellence Pierre Nkurunziza, que je représente ici à la tête de la délégation burundaise. Les thèmes si riches et variés sur la paix et la sécurité dans notre région nous interpellent tous. Donc, je comprends par ici qu'il faut d'abord comprendre ce que c'est l'extrémisme, ce que c'est la xénophobie, ce que c'est le racisme et partant conduire nous tous ce combat contre ces causes de l'instabilité. Les possibilités qu'offre Internet éclipsent largement les difficultés qui en résultent. Vous savez, aujourd'hui avec l'Internet, nous avons la rapidité... But the threats are even bigger on this platform. You know that the proliferation of information today makes us achieve our goals easier and faster. We have a lot of information be, be, before us. 
but also there are the false information and the media wars which makes the hate speech more proliferated. In order to combat all of this, all of us should bear our responsibility. We are sort of decision makers. We should be responsible, not only the youth, but also uh, every one of us. Of course, it's nature that the, the youth are the most um, who use the, the social platforms and digital platforms. So we as decision makers have to head to the youth in order to face this extremism and hate speech. These days, fighting this speech is very important indeed. And as I said, we should fight the media outlet wars. We should use the digital media in a good manner and to work on different levels. Not only those who use the internet, but the decision makers, the households, and everyone in charge. We should sit with the youth in order to encourage them to use these platforms in a good manner. Digital platforms and social media are a fact. Everybody here are connected to the internet. All of us have smartphones. So we should know how internet could be useful for us. What are the good platforms that we can make use of? This entails naturally that local and international policies would be inducing to facing such sort of speech and preve um, preventing it from proliferating on the social media. We as users of these platforms have seen a lot of people who use use them against Burundi and decision makers in Burundi. And we take this false information that are proliferated on these platforms into consideration. At this moment, we decided to go to the streets and to face this, uh, the proliferation of this information. Since long ago, the hate speech was there and extremism and terrorism was there. <laughs> what digital uh, platforms did is that it gave it, gave it space to proliferate in a faster pace. We have started a couple of years ago to prepare a strategy for communication through which we can use the traditional channels that can correct these paths and also We call everybody to be more responsible. We call them to understand that using these platforms is something that helps us fulfill our lives, but in the meantime, they can act as an impedance and a hindrance by means of falsifying information and disseminating uh, false information and rumors, and uh, this is not good. As I said, decision makers and leaders and civil society and especially the youth have to confront these messages if they restrict our movement. They have to face them and this has to be done on a collaborative manner. For example, on Google, Facebook, YouTube, all of these platforms have to help us in this respect, to help us manage these individuals who try to unbalance the societies. We should take necessary steps. We should encourage the youth to bring these practices into light and to file complaints against them on these platforms. If, if we want to live in a better world, this is what we should do. We want to achieve stability and peace for everyone, especially the youth. The youth need to have a better life, more stable life, the life they deserve, the life they can achieve their dreams. Dear youth, 
I take this opportunity to call you to be responsible and to be on the right track and to face these rumors and these practices. We shouldn't say that this is none of our business. Indeed, this is your business. It lies in the core of your very life. Thank you very much. Welcome, sir, once again. When we speak about human rights, the first thing that we think of is the free is the freedom of speech. There is a misconception about the freedom of speech and the inflammatory and hate speech on the social media. We want to we want to know your evaluation uh, between uh, the human rights and the inflammatory talks and why is it spreading? شكرا سيدتي على استضافتي وعلى هذا السؤال اعتقد انكم تسمعونني الان وانا اعتذر شكرا سيدتي على السؤال وقبل ان اجيب عليه اريد ان أشارككم أنني سعيد للغاية بمشاركتي في هذا التجمع الهام في شرم الشيخ وأني محاط بأكثر الناس موهبة في العالم وهذا لا فقط لا يجعلني أشعر أني شاب ولكنني منبهر ب and I must say that uh, looking at you all and listening to you all in different places, it gives me a confidence that our future is not only secure, but is also in better hands. So uh, with this, I come to the particular and very apt question, which is more dealing with the conceptual part. And you're right with Shaima that whenever we are talking about addressing or combating hate speech, there is immediately this counter argument is brought forward and that is the freedom of expression that nobody should be able to touch it. Um, this indeed is one of the most contemporary and crucial questions dealt in the international human rights law. Uh, I've been dealing with this subject for the last two decades and I can tell you by my experience that there is no easy way to deal with it. If you ask me this confusion between this hate speech and the freedom of expression, it is basically, in my view, come from two reasons. The first question is the lack of definition of hate speech. And secondly, when you know that there is some hate speech, how to deal with this hate speech? Hate speech is just a colloquial word. International human rights law does not have a definition of hate speech. And precisely because of the ambiguity and non-consensus on this term, this hate speech, we have this controversy that it can be used for different purposes. On one side, you see governments utilizing specific laws to restrict legitimate expressions which are absolutely fine based on national security, you know, fake news or other aspects to restrict what? Political criticism, political opposition and religious differences. This is the wrong side. But also because of the lack of consensus, what happens is that some governments are not able to or the authorities are not able to actually protect the vulnerable segments of the society, the marginalized segments of the society, which because of this hate speech are liable to be, or their rights are liable to be violated because of the incitement to hatred and violence. So these are the two things. And whenever you have this kind of hatred, which is inciting violence, you have a society where you have frustration. And when you have a frustration in the society, there cannot be any social, economic or political progress. Then comes the second part, and that is where we talk about that even when we have some clarity, 
that yes, this is the hate speech which is leading to some kind of incitement to hatred. We have two groups of people, two groups of views. One particular group is saying that no amount of restriction should be placed on hate speech and the only or the best way forward is to allow more speech, to speak out and that will be the way to curtail the hate speech. Well, in my personal view, to be frank with you, this is one of the way, but this is not the only way. So I, I just wanted to highlight this aspect that we, what are the two definitions, what are the two basically confusions. Now we come to the important part. What does the international human rights law say about it? International human rights law is very clear. Article 19 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights clearly stipulates what is freedom of opinion, what is freedom of expression. The same article in its, you know, Article 19.3 again talks very clearly that this is not an absolute right and provides the specific limitation that can be placed on this right. You go further and you have the next article, which is Article 20, and that again provides that there are certain expressions, and whenever we are talking of advocacy of national, racial, or religious hatred, this has to be proscribed by law. This is not even part of freedom of expression. It cannot be evoked as a freedom of expression. So there you have these two very clarity. I gave you some example about, you know, international human rights law. There's another very important article, which is coming from the International Covenant on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. And where it says that proscribing this kind of hate speech, it is perfectly compatible with the freedom of expression. Having said this, I want to tell you that why international human rights law talks about hate speech and why it says that it has to be proscribed. We are trying to basically, this, the whole conceptualization, later I'll be happy to answer any question. This conceptualization comes from the belief that in any, basically they are trying to reconcile two values. What are those two values? In any democratic society, it should allow freedom of expression. Everybody should be able to express himself or herself and ed open debate should be there. And at the same time, any individual should have the ability to develop and you know, be able to progress. But at the same time, this democratic society also have another very important obligation. And that is that it must protect the vulnerable segment of its society. It must provide protection to the marginalized segment and and provide equal access on a non-discriminatory basis to all segments of the society. So that is where, that while one has the right to say what it has to, he or she has to say, the government also has the right and obligation to protect that the harm caused by this freedom is not affecting the other segment of the society. And all of them can equally and non-discriminatory participate in the society. That is where the conception of the you know, this confusion is coming and what is important. Last, I just wanted to say, because today we are talking about social media, I wanted to be very frank that the laws of freedom of expression and hate speech apply equally to offline and online media. It is unfortunate that the social media, when it started, they were starting not as a media. They don't even consider themselves as a normal media. The, these uh, social media companies initially said that we are not the re regular media, we are just the technical companies. And we are here only to provide open space on equal basis to all voices and stakeholders. And for a very long time, they have been able to stay away from the international human rights law on this speech, and this is not something which is good. Uh, you want to speak? Yes. Okay. You've said earlier that the society should ab abide, should have commitments. Where these commitments come from? Where does this commitment come from? Precisely, uh, Madam Chairman, what I was trying to highlight, that we are all living in a world which is run by some kind of laws 
and regulation. As states, we are members of the United Nations. We are members of the international human rights law. We, as states, are party to different international conventions which govern the behavior of the state. And that is precisely what I was trying to highlight, that international human rights law clearly stipulates what is freedom of expression and what are its limitations. So these are the limitations which are coming from these international human rights treaties. And we, as party to those conventions, must apply them in order to basically uh, provide freedom of expression, but at the same time uh, protect uh, the vulnerable people from the uh, hate speech that incite violence, that incites discrimination and hate. Thank you very much for the for valuable contribution. Thank you. Uh, so uh, the question is for Mrs. Wafa Sandy. Uh, welcome again. In the recent. Uh, period we've seen on social media that terrorist and extremist groups have become um, uh, more uh, proliferated, uh, promulgating their uh, extremist ideology and dogmas on digital platforms. I would like to tell to ask you about the mechanisms for incitation extremism uh, on digital platforms. Good morning. Yes, it's working. Okay. In order to have more insight for the dogma and hate speech on digital platforms, first, we should understand the mindset of these terrorist organizations that you've noted and how they plan to, uh, to uh, use digital platforms for their dogma and extremist uh, ideology. First of all, uh, social media and digital platforms during the the last years are one of the most conducive environments for extremism and hardliners like uh, uh, other uh, terrorist organizations have used social media to uh, promulgate their uh, their dogma and to uh, achieve some of their objectives like attracting or polarizing a great number of women which will be noted in some part of the southeastern Asia and also to attract uh, uh, youth uh, to join interest organization, digital platforms have, have witnessed uh, one of the ma major and severe uh, recruiting campaigns. Uh, other manifestations is highlighting uh, graphic content and also violence on so digital platforms. The fourth, uh, the fourth goal is the intimidation of their called alleged foes by promulgating the footages of. Uh, heavily armed women and children. Fifth, uh, fifth, uh, fifth, these digital platforms were used also to convey or promulgate encoded messages that call for violence, champion violence, like uh, uh, carrying out the lone, uh, terrorist attacks by the lone wolves. Unfortunately, these third organizations have managed to use uh, digital platforms and they have the upper hand in terms of the media production. Uh, yet, uh, these organizations that try to curb uh, extremism in social media are still uh, working on a slow pace. And we should note that internet and social media are the facilitator for broader, uh, broader uh, uh, operations of terrorism and extremism because they facilitate the accessibility of information to hardliners and terrorists, a group of people, a group of young people who share the same extremist ideology and thus inciting or calling for uh, violent conduct or behavior. Other, ter other terrorist organizations have managed to use these websites to call for violence and also to touch upon the needs and also the conduct of certain uh, groups. These uh, these speeches or discourses that, that address uh, the ideology of certain people. On the other hand, we have the government organizations are working on a slow pace and their efforts are still insignificant in this regard. The first part has to do with the legal restrictions and the second part has to do with the content restrictions and also the communication between different uh, parties or stakeholders that are related to this regard as noted by Dr. Marghoub in this uh, in this field. We are facing a prerequisite to incriminate 
or uh, uh, to enact international and national laws that combat uh, extremism and violence uh, content on social media. Some people say that this uh, negates the freedom of expression. However, the other uh, articles of international human law uh, said the opposite. I say that, for instance, that Article 18 for the Global Compact say that it stipulates a number of uh, exceptions that uh, touch uh, touch or uh, are prejudiced to the freedom of expression in cases that jeopardize the security of uh, uh, national security. This exception also for under the international hum uh, humanitarian law. In return, there needs there need to be some sort of prosecutions, uh, proper investigations in this regard, and also to define the concepts and definitions that would conform to the needs, to the uh, dire needs, and also to avoid any uh, uh, any. Uh, 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 any uh, uh, involuntary uh, application of these uh, articles. We all know that uh, some organizations, uh, some states have taken some precautions to to ban uh, violence and extremism uh, digital platforms, including censorship, and also to uh, to uh, to uh, hide or uh, censor uh, a content of violent nature. In terms of the uh, the censorship of violence or graphic content. There are some uh, tangible procedures that, that have been undertaken, but there is still insignificant on the ground. For instance, uh, social media have, uh, like uh, Facebook or Twitter, have been granted a one-hour grace period to delete any post of extremist nature from their uh, digital platforms. However, this one hour grace period is, uh, is, uh, is very conducive for the promulgation of, uh, of uh, the proliferation of these uh, posts on the uh, multiple platforms. And when when restricting or limiting the uh, the uh, the freedom of uh, these terrorist uh, organizations, they have opted for other platforms like the Telegram, other uh, uh, other uh, closed uh, rooms or hacker rooms uh, that uh, uh, include a number of groups that share the same ideology, the same dogmatic ideology, and. Uh, calling for uh, other p uh, other uh, young men to join these rooms and this makes an a hindrance or an obstacle for uh, governments to reach these terrorist platforms because these are clo th these are closed uh, rooms or closed platforms the next point that which is of paramount importance that 40% of the uh, uh, terrorist uh, materials are promulgated on Twitter, while the remaining 60% of the graphic or violent uh, posts are uh, being under, under undertaken in other platforms. Uh, these websites that exist on the internet, but they cannot be revealed by any search engine. Supposedly, or hypothetically speaking, ICT companies, in collaboration with the states, should devise more, more uh, rigid restrictions on social media and digital platforms in order to be more cautious when dealing with the uh, extremist contents. Therefore, it is very necessary, when in terms of live broadcast or live feed, there should be there should be a one in instance or one opportunity for uh, social media users that when rules or applicable regulations are violated they are blocked forever and uh, from using this feature in the f in the future uh, the, the incident the incident in new zealand new zealand have taken place for have been broadcast for uh, for uh, for 16 minutes and f uh, during this period uh, more than 4,000 downloads have taken place, and within the 24, the, the, the 24 hours, more than million downloads have taken place. We, we can we can finger point. Uh, can we finger point uh, the, the responsibility of social media to take responsibility in this regard? I cannot provide a clear answer, but they so, should assume more uh, responsibility in this regard. Unfortunately, we're addressing addressing our message to a group of young men. Maybe they do not believe any formal spe speeches or statements issued by the governments. This might be this might raise the flag for them. So we need new uh, active partners, new key players in this regard. More. Uh, 
ca customization for social media that would conform to their needs, that would confirm their mindset. We should be more innovative when handling social media and when devising uh, the speeches that uh, counter uh, extremism. And we also need to engage uh, civil society in counter narratives because they are the most the most uh, the most uh, uh, in, the most uh, the, the, the entity with, that is in, cont in contact with their role players, they should assume more responsibility. We should provide more protections uh, for activists who launch anti-terrorism or anti-extremism uh, campaigns. Or social media, uh, social media platforms should ban should if should uh, provide more accessible means for those activists they sh their information their information their data should remain confidential and when uh, and uh, providing information to law enforcement authorities should take a more appropriate course of action in nigeria uh, there was a campaign like give us back our girls give us back our uh, our children which has been widely acclaimed by the uh, the public and we studied the factors for the success of this campaign it we found that it depend, depended on three main pillars that we hope that the governments would should should uh, should use in the future the campaign was a, a video footage a short video footage in terms of the form but in terms of the content uh, it conveyed messages that did not attack, did not pro, uh, attack the government. It was some vivid messages that would, uh, was uh, promulgated in a more uh, ironic or sarcastic means. So they depended in the first place on figures, uh, 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 inspirational figures of credibility to the public. So, uh, so they would uh, reach uh, uh, a broader segment of the public. Thank you very much for your valuable contribution. Thank you. <clears throat> for this reason, the World uh, Youth Forum provides a platform for uh, communication with the youth in order to come up with more profitable uh, uh, recommendations to be undertaken on the ground. Uh, so, and now I would like to uh, direct myself to Mr. Hafiz Abu Saada. You have a huge experience in the field of the public works. Out of this experience, what's the individual responsibility and the public responsibility on the level of states and institutions to have an, an internet free of extremism and hate speech? And what are the boundaries of this responsibility in uh, the light of the mix between uh, the freedom and responsibility under the tech pretext of extremism and hate speech? Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me to participate in the World Youth Forum and this is indeed an opportunity to speak to you and um, given that this is the first time and I think that the topics discussed here are all a very important uh, topics some of them are related to sustainable development others are related to the freedom of expression and human rights the main topic in this discussion as we have talked already, I mean uh, the previous panelists, is the struggle between the freedom of expression and opinion um, from one hand. On the other hand, the instigation on hate, discrimination and extremism. As the gentleman who preceded me said, we have three articles in the international and in instruments 18, 19, and 20. 18 talks about freedom of um, religion and belief. 19 talks about the freedom of opinion and dissemination by all means. 20, 20 warns against hate speech and religious and all sorts of discrimination and oppression. Nevertheless, there is a huge demonstration of the shortage of transforming these items into incrimination. There is no crime, hate crime in many of the legislatures around the world. 
and in the Rabat conference uh, where they were discussing violence and terrorism, they concluded that they should review the legislations in most of the countries of the world where there is no clear incrimination of violence and the instigation on violence and the instigation on uh, the terrorism and the discrimination. What takes place on the digital platform is dangerous indeed. I agree that this is now a complete uh, organized body that gives orders to commit crimes and gives information about uh, how to make bombs and explosives and also provides financing. So we have a complete financing structure and organizational structure that not only threatens Arab or Islamic countries but threatens the world in its eternity. In France, the Paris cell which have been uh, caught, they discovered that they were communicating through internet either in the choice of the logistics or the arms and weapons and the financing, everything was done through the internet. The internet is the main communication method for all terrorist organizations in the world and if you recall uh, the incident of uh, the explosive car in, uh, in front of the oncology institute, the person who delivered the perpetrator, they found that the, he has uh, called his brother on Instagram. So Instagram uh, is used for mobilization and uh, also all terrorism, all terroristic acts around the world. Yes, this indeed, this is what I mean. The social media is now used as a means of organization and communication uh, between terrorists. It makes it very easy for them to communicate anywhere and everywhere in the world and to mobilize persons to recruit uh, new uh, faces. What does this mean? This means that we should separate and draw a defining line between freedom of expression on one hand, on the other hand, having a sovereign state that re have the respect to expression, a freedom of expression, and also in the meantime, incrimination should take place on the world level, not only in a single country or a, a couple of countries and others um, instigate under the pretext of uh, um, practicing freedom of expression there are incidents of persons placed on criminal lists, but uh, countries, specific countries, refuse to uh, extradite them because um, they use the pretext of freedom of expression. So, so we should draw a defining line between freedom of expression and terrorism and extremism. Also, I want to talk about the international cooperation because we have to cooperate on two pivots. The first is to incriminate hate crimes should be incriminated and the second pivot is an international cooperation to control the, the cyberspace because leaving the cyberspace unsupervised like what happens today and without the ability to uh, track these groups and to control them I think this will lead to even more dangerous operations, especially that now we are about to receive the fifth generation of the Internet, which is faster and more capable. With the advent of the fifth uh, generation or uh, 5G, unless the world sits together and makes or launches a defined strategy to face the organized uh, crime. Uh, terrorism crimes, we will be facing a lot of problems. And uh, in the United Nations Forum, our m m ministers have been sitting and talking about the dangers of organized crime. I do not think that human rights can be protected unless 
unless terrorism and the terroristic organizations uh, would be put uh, to space. Thank you very much, Mr. Hafiz Abu Saada. Now to Miss Amira Al Adli, welcome to the World Youth Forum in its third iteration. As a young girl who is interested in public work, how, what do you think about limiting limitation, the uh, uh, widespread of uh, inflammatory and hate uh, discourse in the internet? Okay, you have said at the beginning that we need legislations to stop this kind of uh, uh, hate speech. We need to curb the bullying. And because I'm using most of the time the social media, I'm, I'm using Twitter, Facebook, Telegram, I want to convey our perception as young people. We need, because we are living in a world that is advancing every day and major technological advances are happening we want to use the technology in its correct form and with the correct mechanisms which means that the, not all technologies are bad yes there is inflammatory speech and hate speech but let us look at the reasons before we look at the uh, at the phenomena itself. We have economic reasons whenever we have uh, unemployment, uh, underdevelopment, when we are, the more we have this, the more we ha are more liable to be, to see organizations and um, uh, there is cultural reasons and other social reasons that have something to do with the media speech. Our media speech, uh, to whom are we directing it, are with media speech. Uh, does our media speech does not contain uh, uh, inflammatory and hate and discriminatory speech? We need to do this first in our media speech that we do not, sh we should not uh, instigate bullying and and violence and we should be on the side of uh, the accept the culture of accepting others the culture of uh, uh, religious discourse uh, uh, discussion between religions other social reasons for this that has to do with the level and the quality of education we need to have to take out all from our educational syllabus anything that can instigate hate and discrimination and the unacceptance of people who are different we have to enforce in our education syllabus the value of uh, uh, human rights and the freedom of speech the more we enforce this value the more we will be able to make the people on the internet more aware with the idea that they can discriminate between what is hate speech, violent speech, and the freedom of speech. I'm, uh, I'm just concerned that all what we say on our, uh, web, uh, on our sites and social media, how can uh, and how uh, can we stop this? We can stop it by giving more freedoms and we allowing more people to be involved in political work. And we have uh, uh, political practice and save our people. We will save our people from falling in these organizations. There are many sites uh, in the internet uh, that has relations with fanatic organizations and we stopped it. Uh, when we stop it, there are several applications that can help you open it again. Even if uh, for the states who stopped Twitter and Facebook, people can uh, uh, defeat this and they can reload these things uh, despite all this um, uh, uh, trials to stop it. We speak about international uh, uh, artificial intelligence, that's fine, but we need to look at our education syllabus and we need to work on culture and sports and make sports available for people in the youth centers that has ver uh, that can contain various kinds of sports, uh, sensitization uh, discussions, and we can educate people on how to use uh, the uh, means of social media. We can put in the education syllabus uh, 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 
uh, studies and lessons about uh, programming. Those who are sitting, our young people who are sitting uh, and using uh, social media and uh, technology all day, not all social media are bad, but there can be a better usage of it. The uh, more important thing is to, to, to look at the details and to look at the effort, sensitization efforts and the awareness of the human rights and people rights. Let me comment on something of what you said. Thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to ask you, there are states, countries, that uh, are developed that uh, have young people that were dragged into inflammatory and hate uh, speeches uh, they have education and they have enough education uh, quality education and uh, the good standards of living but anyway they were dragged into uh, this by the fanatic organization and uh, we cannot overlook the intelligence. How intelligent are these organizations when they talk to people? This is something we all know. But when we speak about the international community and the international movement against this phenomena, we are doing this. Yes. We are doing this because we think that there is a big group of people here from the Western, a good number of people that have been dragged into this fanatic organizations from the developed and the under and from the uh, Middle East. How can we deal with young people to curb this and combat this phenomena? Because uh, all, not all young people who are involved in hate, the speech and the violence, we can say that they haven't been well educated or they are suffering social problems. Let me say that there are uh, young people from uh, developed countries and they have better economy than the rest of the world. And despite this, they have been uh, dragged into this organization. Those who, you, who uh, joined this uh, uh, fanatic organization and terrorist organization. We say that there are many reasons uh, related to uh, political practice and education, but we can say that anyone who is living in uh, an advanced country that had he received the best uh, type of education or that they are not suffering from problems like discrimination. There are uh, discrimination or racial discrimination in European countries. They discriminate between people according to their color or if you are coming from another country and you be naturalized but you are not like the people living in this country. There is uh, religious discrimination. Any place that has uh, types of violence or uh, in, uh or discrimination uh, or uh, it's not it's not linked to the financial level but it's it's linked to the chances that give me the right or give me the uh, the way to uh, adopt a bad culture not all of them, of people living in this, have the awareness. How can we sensitize our people? Very simply, if there are uh, legislations and youth who have electronic platform must feel the responsibility that the 140 letters that they write on Twitter or the what they write on Facebook, we need to look and review the policy in Facebook. And let me speak about our experience in the Middle East, that we feel there is a difference between Facebook policy in the Middle East and Facebook policy in the other parts of the world. And that's very clear in eliminating some uh, videos and stopping accounts. We need to increase the uh, reactive platforms with people. We have many pages, we should have many pages that is speaking about political awareness without having restrictions. The same thing, 
that uh, we have uh, uh, many pages speaking about Islamophobia and others. Uh, this is not under the highlight. We need to highlight the uh, pages that are combating and confronting uh, terrorism and the takfiri thoughts. So we need to support young people who are facing and combating this kind of thoughts. Thank you, Ms. Amira Lal. Right. Uh, in fact, we're going back to Mrs. Evelyn Boutillier. Welcome again for the second part of the questions in our our panel discussion. I would like to reiterate uh, the panelists that we're, we will have to uh, commit to the five minute uh, timeline for the questions because we're running out of time because we need to have some sort of feedback by the end of this uh, panel discussion. Going back to Mrs. Evelyn, welcome again. I would like uh, you to tell me what are the best practices, internationally recognized practices in terms of the government and also in our African continent in combating hate speech and uh, incitation, violence on digital platforms and how to maximize the role played by the youth in these experiences. Thank you again for... for uh, for uh, for letting me uh, in again for this panel discussion please use the mic please use the mic thank you again thank you again for your I believe that uh, that blocking the internet users and to uh, to to call them uh, for this uh, approach is very important. I believe that it, it is very uh, crucial to under, understand the nature of social media and digital platforms because for today I'm using Twitter, Facebook, and other uh, other social media like Instagram, for instance. However, there are other digital platforms that, that I'm not familiar with uh, sometimes when they talk about me on social media, for instance, or my, uh, my affiliation. We, we need to understand first how to use these digital platforms. We've said that internet and digital platforms are some sort of uh, a double-edged weapon that we can use them in a positive and negative ways. What is very important to us is the negative approach that we need to avoid, how to avert the deficiencies of social media and to stop, stop the proliferation, to curb the proliferation of these fanatic messages that call for hate and violence. Therefore, we uh, uh, stakeholders, relevant stakeholders need to intervene to sensitize the youth and to avert them the uh, the the evils of the these uh, hate messages uh, for me uh, in my capacity as the ministry of the youth in Burundi tomorrow there will be another young man or woman who will replace me will take be who will be in charge of this position they need to prepare themselves for this starting from now not tomorrow I'm telling the young people to that you should prepare to replace us in the future and to wait for the perfect time to do this because in the way they are waiting for this position, being prepared for this position, they need to develop themselves and to be further committed with a clear-cut vision. If you need to change the world, you should invest, invest first in yourself. Today we see a group of people, young people, who attend or participate in this World Youth Forum. They have been invited 
those are leaders. Their leaders being invited. The message that we should tell them is that they should approach their peers, their young peers, and to sensitize them against the messages of hate and violence. And I'm well certain that that the, the youth have their dreams, and and there are means to make these these dreams come true in in in, in countries of peace prosperity and security and of course with people who use social media and the most appropriate means they they are leaders and they are, should adopt legislations and regulations that would protect us when it is about social media and how to use social media everyone should should pay attention to this what if we do not know the the, the way uh, to use social media and appropriate means we cannot combat these negative practices we should have this this sort of commitment in a more responsible way because we need peace security and to over uh, and with the, uh, the help of internet, uh, ICT, we should approach our complaints to the officials if there are some, if there are practices of this sort, of this negative approach, because the information being provided us by other, by people in charge or officials promulgate in a slower pace compared to rumors that are being proliferated on social media and digital platforms. So what I'm saying is that the most important and crucial factor is that we should know how to use digital platforms in a more responsible way. The youth, including, uh, including me, we should be familiar uh, on the way how to use social media. And I think everybody, every one of you, uh, and also my, uh, my colleague panelists, we are four ladies and two gentlemen. We are the majority were committed on how to use social media in a more responsible way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, please. I would like to ask you, do you have an African vision that we can use with the hate speech and uh, on the social media uh, in a joint manner as African countries? In terms of Egypt, I am I am here, and in order to I am here to combat this sort of hate speech. And my presence here on the land of Egypt is the best demonstration of this. Thank you very much. We will get once more to Mr. Marghub Salim on the, in the second round of questions. And the question to you, sir, you have huge experience in the diplomatic field and the international organizations. What's, what's your assessment of the role of the international organizations in fighting hate speech and uh, violence and instigation on digital platforms? A very valid question. But uh, before I go to that, I would like to say that I'm really, you know, stand uh, wise, further wise on this important subject, learning to my distinguished, uh, you know, colleague panelists. Uh, they have brought very important aspects of this, you know, collective fight that we should be doing both at uh, home and, you know, at the global level. Um, but what we have, you know, come up, uh, as a clear uh, point is that hate speech is a menace, is a menace to any democratic value, to social stability. And at the same time, it is something which also affects the peace and security. So having known that these are the things, these are the, you know, side effect, what comes out, the, it comes out that everyone at the individual, at the society, at the national, at the private companies level, at the global level, has to respond to this phenomenon. Silence is not an option. We all have to act. Okay. When we talk about the social media, we are talking of the internet, why it becomes a little more pronounced? It becomes pronounced because nowadays, because of its outreach, with one stroke at the, your keypad, you reach out to millions, no, billions of people. 
and the impact is beyond your imagination. I don't want to get into the definition or the explanations or examples. You know what, is hap hap what happened in New Zealand, what happened in Norway, what happened in Myanmar, uh, what happened in Sri Lanka. So we're not getting, but that is precisely the reason because social media is being used as a platform for bigotry. The public discourse is being weaponized, is weaponized for political gain. That's why we need to react. Now, you said, what are the responsibilities, what we should do? I want to give you a few examples for everyone. At the individual level, as you, me, us, each one of us have to act. The first thing that we can do is that every time you see hate speech, you should speak out. You should stand with the oppressed. You should talk about the right people. If somebody is being marginalized, talk about it that he or she is being marginalized. If you know what is wrong, say that this is wrong. Say that this is fake news. Say that what you are saying to stereotype is wrong. Second and a very important aspect, what we always do, all of us, sometime I receive a message from a friend, we just like it or not like, I just forward it. That's the worst thing we can do in our individual context. None of us should forward something until and unless we can verify the facts. Because maybe someone has just sent it, but my you know, friend who has a faith in me, when a post comes from me, he takes it as a true. And it may or may not be true. And that is where your responsibility comes in. This is individual level. Now we go a little step further. What is the role of the state? The state also has a very important role to play here. First, we should, all states should have clearly determined hate speech in their laws. When they determine the hate speech in their laws, they should always have this principle of legality, legitimacy, and proportionality. I'll be happy to define it, but this is very important that we should do it. All states should have independent judicial mechanism where people can go for redress and remedy. All states should have independent monitoring bodies, and there are many examples in the Western countries, where they should, they should not have a state authority, but they should be independent monitoring bodies who should watch the online and offline content for hate speech. The moment they find it, they should be able to put it down. Likewise, a state should get in touch with these online or you know, media companies and try to have a partnership whereby they ensure that their content, their you know, regulations have some kind of filtration mechanism for hate speech. Next is the companies, these internet companies, what they should do. Combating hate speech will start from the beginning, from where the product start. And that product is, we are today talking about digital, you know, the online media. The first thing that the companies need to do is that there is a very good guiding principle uh, made by the, you know, in the International Human Rights Framework, it's available, it's called Guiding Principle for Business and Human Rights they should start implementing this. This is the first step. Second step, they, whatever filtration they have used, the policies of hate speech these companies have used, that should fully be compatible and under the international human rights law. They cannot say that we have our own policies of hate speech. No, that would not serve the purpose. The third thing that these companies need to do is that whatever is their policy, whatever is the hate speech law, it should be openly available to all member states. Uh, I'm sorry, I got in. not to state, but all users. They should be available and they should be able to do that. Uh, and last and a very important point for this companies is that they sometimes say that we use algorithm and artificial intelligence to, you know, filtration. No, that has not been able to, you know, do justice. You have to involve human element, the moderator, human moderator. Just to give you a small example, in the case of Myanmar, Facebook did take some action and they were trying to curb the, you know, uh, hate speech. But can you imagine when uh, people talk to them, they only had one or two Burmese speaking people as moderator who could find out. Imagine the millions of, you know, posts on hate speech and they had not even enough resources 
to filter it. So those things are important. Last, I come to your point that you talk about UN and other international organizations. Indeed, a very important role, Ms. Shaima. If you remember, it is the duty of United Nations to combat armed conflict, atrocity crime, protection of vulnerable, migrants, refugees, all those people marginalized who are affected by that hate speech, it is their duty. And never to forget that the United Nations, the establishment of United Nations is the result of the nightmare that ensued when the virulent hate speech was tolerated for too long. Just two points uh, on the hate speech by the uh, United Nations should immediately start you know, a global partnership involving all stakeholders, private companies, states, civil society, media, re uh, uh, religious leaders, and try to find out what are the root causes, the drivers of hate speech, and then be able to promote the uh, values of global uh, citizenship, which talks about digital citizenship. And I'll be happy to explain that. But these are some of the important things that they should be able to do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Marghoub Salim. Now I'll get back to Ms. Wafa. Uh, can you evaluate the role of women to combat uh, the hate speech? Uh, this is very important for us as women, and it's important for the community and for the whole world, actually. So if there is a role that can be uh, mentioned now, Tell us how can we uh, better uh, make it more effective? Uh, uh, thank you for this very important question. Uh, please allow me at the beginning to go back to, th uh, to 2015, who was not affected the uh, with, with the girl, French girl from the uh, uh, Moroccan origin, uh, origin who was killed in a terrorist attack. Here, uh, it was the first time to mention a woman's name in a terrorist uh, attack. And uh, last year, there is um, a Tunisian girl who blew up herself. Uh, there are women from East and from West, they have abandoned uh, their settled life and their quiet life to join ISIS. What we noticed uh, can maybe the terrorist phenomena is uh, uh, is old, but what's what's worth mentioning that there is an increasing number of women who are participating in uh, terrorism. Uh, studies say that from 10 to 15 percent of the foreign uh, and the alien fighters in uh, Syria and Iraq are women. This ISIS organization built its uh, strategy on attracting the biggest number of women to give the impression that it's an integrated and wholesome uh, uh, community that is able to attract uh, children, women, and uh, youth, which give it a more uh, uh, a forceful and powerful organization. In Indonesia, one year ago, there was a whole family consisting of a husband, wife, and three children who uh, carried out uh, terrorist attacks. Uh, this is a new form of terrorism, which is a family terrorism. The role of women inside the terrorist uh, organization are very complicated. You cannot just limit it to that she is following men or male's name uh, uh, and their roles is either a sexual role or to uh, serve the fighters but they have more complicated uh, tasks uh, they uh, are working on the uh, social media and they are uh, attracting people and those who are uh, carrying out espionage so we can 
to understand the role of women on the on the social media we have to say that there is a, a fem feminine terrorism and we and governments should uh, look at this point uh, when they are building their strategies women must be participating in preparing and implementing all the strategies anti terrorist strategies in our arab countries because we are involved either directly or indirectly in this phenomenon we can give women safe uh, platforms for women and for women organizations to have roles whether whether in surveillance and watching the contents uh, in, on the Facebook and the social media and report it to the to the uh, authorities and uh, follow up if there was a, a, a remove of this content. Women can can have a very active role in this because women are more uh, effective in the community and they may have a more uh, reliable or uh, 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 talk and they are uh, trusted and we can also uh, carry out and do some platform that is dedicated for women who uh, use it to transfer knowledge and speak about human rights and the right f uh, to be different. We must be aware that women is not only uh, uh, something to make researches on, but she can have a very effective role in the anti-terrorism strategies. Generally, on the uh, generally in the community and specifically on the social media. Going back to Dr. Hafiz Abu Sa'da, you've talked earlier about the individual responsibility and all as well the collective responsibility. However, we will not be remiss to know the role of uh, NGOs and civil society in combating hate speech. What is your evaluation of this role by the NGOs and the success or the progress achieved so far and how to effectively maximize the role of these NGOs? Thank you for this question. It is very essential that we know the NGOs and civil society, the role played by NGOs and civil society, and how to open a more a broader horizon for civil society to work and operate. Generally speaking, I uh, I mean, in all activities and uh, and specifically in combating hate speech, I can shape the role in two points. First, to monitor, spot, and combat uh, hate crimes uh, via uh, online platforms, which is very uh, paramount importance because they work under a, a cover of political uh, and ideological work and we need to divulge uh, these uh, violent approaches these should be stigmatized as hate crimes it should be termed under international laws as hate crimes and to be stigmatized supported by international laws Just, this is the regulatory and monitoring role and to create a public mindset counter to that of hate speech and discriminatory uh, calls of other groups against marginalized and vulnerable groups. The second point I would like to note is is to empower them in terms of the content that they can log into the content and to create platforms that promulgate the principles of uh, empathy and coexistence the values and principles of human rights, the freedom of expression, the freedom of belief, the freedom of opinion. I mean that we should have alternative platforms or offering alternative platforms before the public, providing spaces for expression, vocalizing their opinion. And so depends on a clear cut vision, not a single vision, which is the hate, hatred and hate, hate speech is the second role, which I, I believe that assume a paramount importance and should be given a more focus is the interaction with the UN mechanisms in this regard. In the Human Rights Council, there are periodical meetings, representation from other organizations. This organization can compile reports on hate crimes and discrimination, discriminatory approaches or conduct, and to report them in UN 
documents to be observed and noted by the international community and to call them to mo make more collective efforts in this regard. These are very important roles to be undertaken by the international community and I believe in my opinion that if they can assume this role it would give an impetus in combating hate crimes. Thank you very much Dr. Hafez Abu Saada for your contribution. Uh, last but not least, I would like to a uh, question, Miss uh, Amina al -Aitli. In your opinion, what are the most appro appropriate means to s sensitize the youth against the negative implications of using social media and how to combat hate speech and crime and to sensitize them against these forms of hatred? Let me first uh, uh, continue. The, what I've, uh, what I've uh, uh, spoke earlier, that in order to reach more tangible uh, procedures in terms of social media and the youth, there are other uh, procedures that are pertinent to the youth themselves and collective responsibility of the community and those related to the to the state and the nation why of a nationwide wager i need we we need to revise the definition a opposite of hatred to give it a clear-cut definition so that we can devise our policies and regulations that would confirm to the the global the un global compact and international regulations that would define the boundaries of hate crimes bullying and other forms of violence because it it takes it should be regarded uh, considered from different perspectives we need to get a clear definition of hatreds uh, determinative of the determinative nature so that we can enact respective laws because in a in a in a in a, in a world of social media that is dominated by social media we need to to uh, resort to, uh, to take law as a refuge in Egypt, we have the Takafran Karama initiatives. We need uh, social and solidarity. We have to we have to adopt more tangible procedures to increase the quality of education and to filter out the curricula that incite for uh, bullying and hatred. We need to work. We uh, we need to be in contact with the future generations, the children in fa in particular. We need to start from the emerging generations, those who need to uh, to embrace the other, to accept the culture of the other, to abhor bullying. And I would like to tell you that w there was a recent bullying incident against a Sudanese student. A Sudanese uh, students wouldn't have been for for the social media. We would not be familiar with that momentum of bullying and that incidents, bullying incidents taking place in Egypt. People would, were not uh, uh, were not familiar with this fact. People thought that if we deride or derogate the other uh, in terms of their uh, color or appearance, this is something uh, insignificant. We need to tell people, we need to sensitize people in terms of culture, sports, arts, and drama to sensitize them against bullying, uh, hate crimes, to encourage them in equality and empathy towards the other. In terms of the individual responsibility, this would be achieved in creating a mindset by giving impetus to the activists and people in people in this regard with an organization that that would give more a considerable load to NGOs and civil society to help them create in the mindset and conscious of the public. This is the means for uh, for creating and shaping the uh, individual mindset. Without this, it's very hard to uh, to uh, to give responsibility for the community in large. There needs to be some sort of efforts to sensitize the the youth to uh, to make demarcations against uh, between uh, hatred, bullying, and other forms. We need to have guidelines for mass media to make a demarcation between hate speech and violence and the original mass. Uh, uh, media discourse. There is some sort of confusion between between hatred, national security, and other similar concepts that would make it available for us to tackle other concepts. Uh, being seditious mongers or uh, subconsciously being subconsciously seditious mongers, we need to other uh, regulations, guidelines of international nature that relate to the the mass the media discourse and also the targeted uh, practices and how to to address different age brackets, uh, different ages, and to touch upon uh, topics related to hate speeches, bullying, and other related concepts that would fall under discrimination 
and hatred, how to uh, tackle them in terms of media and press. Uh, in fact, you were talking about the, 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 that, the, that man that who was, uh, was uh, who was honored by His Excellency the President in the uh, opening ceremony. Yes, this is a, a strong evidence of the approach taken by the leadership, our leaders, uh, leadership. It's some sort of a remedy. We're addressing the whole world. We're addressing our youth that we're not only against following or other negative phenomena, but we also pay focus to giving people the rights to uh, remedy them. We're, we're championing the values of fraternity, uh, coexistence, love and peace. We do not have any discrimination in terms of color, religion, or any other factor. This is a very strong message for the Egyptian and world youth as well. This is some sort of wrong practices that would have further negative catastrophic implications. Yes, I would like that this was a very humanistic uh, step taken by the president. Thank you for your enriching contribution. Thank you. Now we will give the floor for comments within two minutes for you. And we will start with the lady here if you have any comment or recommendation that we can deliver in the, at the end of our session for the youth. Thank you very much for giving me the floor back again. I thank the Egyptian government for organizing this event in the third, third round of the World Youth Forum, which has become a platform for the exchange of experiences towards a better world in Africa, the United Africa, through the youth who have a clear vision. This is a message of thanks for His Excellency President Assisi and my counterpart in charge of the youth in Egypt. I sincerely thank you for your hospitality since we set foot in Egypt where the civilizations also brought together. I thank President Sisi once more. I thank the Egyptian government. And I, on behalf of His Excellency, the President of Burundi, I thank the government of Egypt. Mr. Marghoub Salim, your comments or recommendations, please. It's just like the concluding words. So I first uh, wanted to once again um, thank the organizer for organizing such a wonderful you know, event. Uh, this indeed uh, is uh, not just needed, but it is the requirement of the time. People talk about it that um, a youth is our future. And then what happens is actually that we, as you know, people with 50 years of age, we start talking about what youth need. No, I think these are the type of events that we need to organize. If you want to talk about our future, that future should be sitting and talking about its future. So we need to have more voices of the youth so that they can tell us what is right, how they look at it, and then we should have the policies which include their input. This is number one. So from that angle, I wanted to say that this is a very wonderful uh, you know, um, um, event which contributes. Last, but I wanted to say that um, from the perspective of this very important event, well, or the topic of this particular panel, I think that there is some realization now that the social media companies have re started realizing that the impact of this hate speech on social media is something that they need to tackle. That is the time that we need to reach out. And as I was saying earlier, we have, need to have a broader partnership that must involve international you know, uh, organizations like UN, regional organizations, private media companies, states, civil society, youth leadership, and come to find out what are the drivers of hate, find the solution, and promote the values of tolerance and pluralism. Thank you. Shukran gazilan. Shukran lahadrakat. Asayida Wafa Sandi. Ms. Wafa Sandi, I want to know your comments or recommendations before we conclude our meeting today. Uh, 
Are you facing a problem in the in the mic? I have a comment and some recommendations. As I've mentioned in the beginning of my intervention is that social media and the internet is but a facilitator which gives the facility for each and everyone, including the youth who have uh, the preparedness to adopt the hate speech. Fighting extremism first starts by knowing the uh, reasons behind it and the efforts exerted in this effort could bring a certain fruit but may not um, eliminate it completely. As for my recommendations, there is a necessity to enact national and international laws to incriminate disseminating hate speech on social media outlets. We have to identify and define the uh, definitions related to extremism and terrorism and hate speech. Second, entrenching the cooperation between all stakeholders from governments and technology companies and civil society, including the youth and women organizations, so that we can bring together the political, uh, technical and social experiences and also entrenching and deepening the international cooperation and the exchange of uh, the best practices and policies. Thank you very much. Dr. Hafez Abu Saada. Um, s s sorry, I'll get back to you, sir. Please, at the microphone, please. The microphone is not working. No, it's not on. The microphone is off. I'm sorry, the microphone is off. The fourth recommendation is the necessity to include women in the different strategies against extremism and terrorism, either in the fields of preparation, uh, implementation, or assessment. Thank you very much. Now we will get back to you, Dr. Hafez Abu Saada. I would like to know your recommendations or your last comments during this session. Thank you very much. Of course, I second the opinions of my previous speakers in thanking you for choosing this topic because it's very important indeed. I think the United Nations has an important role to play in facing extremism and hate speech because in reality the most important recommendation is to raise the capacity of the countries in facing terrorism, extremism, and hate speech, and to provide the legal definition of the hate crimes because um, um, it comes in different literatures. Uh, for example, like contempt of religion, and uh, the word contempt is very restricted and doesn't give any definition of uh, the, uh, hate. It's, it's more like an insult, uh, whereas hate is much wider, violence is much wider, and leads to committing terrorism. Hence, it entails international efforts to place down a precise definition that could eventually lead it to be legislated in different legislatures to incriminate such activities. Thank you very much. Ms. Amira Al-Adli, please uh, need to see to hear your comments. Let's say that we need to uh, review the uh, UN Charter, and it, uh, we are speaking about a very old document. We need it to be upgraded and developed to suit the, uh, uh, the current uh, ages. And we have to define uh, discrimination and uh, crimes related to it, and hate and crimes related to it to it we need legislations to uh, criminalize such hate we need to have facebook and and social media that uh, confirm with the uh, other charters and un agreements so we and uh, this topic uh, has something to do with most of the people, not only in Egypt, but the uh, entire world. We have to talk to uh, young people about the use of social media and how they use it and the new technologies. How can we, how can they defend themselves and how to uh, make differentiation between freedom of speech and hate speech. We need to safeguard the youth from falling in the hands of 
of the uh, terrorist organizations that are found in on the social media we have to to give the chance to uh, young people to put these legislations and say exactly what they want to do Dr. Ashraf Sobhi, uh, Minister uh, Ashraf Sobhi's Excellency, thank you for coming and joining us. We need to uh, listen to your comment before we conclude the discussion of today. First, I would like to thank the panel for this kind of culture uh, and distinguished thoughts uh, that, are, that is very deep and uh, diverse. Um, I would like to thank uh, the young people, the Egyptian young people who day after day uh, they participate in all kind of forums have reached a very good uh, uh, organization and I would like to uh, welcome uh, the Minister of Burundi and I uh, want to thank her we are working together since long time and yesterday we made um, many uh, visits for the establishment made for youth and youth centers. I would like to welcome all who are here coming from all over the world. The issue is very important and you have raised a very important uh, point, uh, the role of uh, youth centers and uh, recreation manager, how can they deal with their uh, idle time and the um, day's agenda to be filled with uh, important issues and uh, beneficial issues and the criminalization and the role of international laws uh, in uh, combating this phenomena and its relation to the human rights actually there is there are diverse thoughts but let me get out of the legislative and the criminalizing uh, of this phenomena let's speak about dealing with it on the social level and the cultural level and technological level too <clears throat> maybe the whole world is uh, tr is getting ready for the uh, vast and very uh, quick speedy uh, uh, advancement and if if we did not study accurately what we are doing we will have something called Netflixing uh, in the old times we used to to use the tape recorder but then we stopped using it it's not because there is something wrong but because that it has overdone uh, overrun its course there are more advanced things that uh, show up and uh, and that's why we stopped using it our performance uh, should be according to this level. We are not going to speak about criminalizing and we have to admit the reality. There are uh, psychological studies about the FOMO that talk about the FOMO, which is the internet addiction. We have to, everyone have to know that uh, what the devices uh, they are using and uh, life now is limited to the mobile and the uh, social media and there, this is something that has been reflected in the social relationships. Ships. We need to know the needs and the demands and the changes that are happening with uh, people. We must research this and we must uh, know their need and their desires. Everyone in the uh, community has his own desires and it's changing from one country to another. We in Egypt are very keen on having research on this uh, things uh, with the uh, our people and we are putting uh, definitions for the ages and for their needs. In our ministry we are linking everything to science and uh, the 
uh, we are linking it to the changes that the young people go through in terms of age and uh, in terms of uh, needs. So there, we are not going to change their thoughts. We cannot uh, uh, ask people to stop using the mobile because starting the year uh, five years of age they start using this thing and the amount of uh, knowledge they gain is massive we cannot stop it but we have to go out of the netflixing uh, our variable and various programs are integrated it is not only the responsibility of education we have to have it and uh, alongside with it um, if we follow the uh, change in the way Egyptians think in education and the use of technology and the use of myth and the change in methodology, any uh, any management of change should uh, is usually f uh, faced with resistance. But when you continue and, pers and become persistent in what you're doing, people will accept it. I'm speaking about our reality in Egypt and the way uh, Egyptian thinks on the cultural level and on the sport level we have an integrated system but I'm speaking about our ministry uh, we have analyzed such uh, issues and we integrated in it and linked between sports in the leisure time with the different ages and the sports as a modeling in uh, championships that's why when I say sports uh, we are facing a big advancement uh, and we have uh, world champions in many games. This we are using as a model for young people and we are uh, giving them the initiative to be like such heroes and champions and we are upgrading our sport facilities and helping those who want to learn. We are making grassroots so that we can expand the uh, participation and uh, the uh, usage of uh, such uh, things. We have made also uh, social programs and uh, uh, carried out and established a sports park for uh, the uh, disadvantaged places and the poor places. We are trying to make a, a, a practical conf uh, practical uh, solution. Is this is that only? No, it is not that only. The direct programs we have on the level of education, we have initiatives. And uh, in 2018, we have a plan to uh, carry out 500 programs uh, that, uh, inc that include 10 uh, million uh, young people. We are making a category from 10 to 15 and from 18 to 40. This is another category and we are formulating these programs on this basis. Uh, these programs uh, are are carried out in the youth centers and in other community centers. We have a program called uh, uh, daily uh, uh, daily efforts, or we have uh, bring some trainers to train them on uh, uh, on the uh, on uh, abandoning violence and abandoning discrimination. And we have made a partnership with the UNICEF and uh, the development program the UN development program and uh, it has achieved uh, a lot in uh, in the trainings and we have had uh, uh, direct initiatives like or our uh, manners it's uh, uh, focusing on uh, hate speech and we have integrated between the Ministry of Education schools and the youth centers and the convoys we send in to many uh, destinations nations. We had a protocol with the Nasser Military Academy to carry out uh, educational programs 
and to uh, uh, make the the uh, uh, security, the national security uh, initiative uh, effective. How to combat the uh, rumors and how to do rapid uh, the rapid changes? We are studying this kind of uh, uh, phenomena. This is one part from the Egyptian government in the Ministry of Youth and Sports. Uh, this is done in coordination with the Ministry of Communication uh, that all our facilities will have uh, communication uh, uh, facilities and uh, internet and uh, e-facilities and e-training and we are now linking electronically uh, between all our facilities we are linking our programs to have an integrated image in many uh, issues on, on many uh, parts. Uh, what I want to say that we have to have a scientific uh, approach and the directives that we are taking from the president is to do awareness and uh, to integrate the young people. That's why we do this with more than one ministry like Al-Kaf, like Al-Azhar, like the Egyptian church. We are uh, carrying out big programs on the community level because we believe that education starts in uh, from the beginning and the technology is used before the age of five for our by our children at home and even the three or f when there are three or four people uh, sitting together even if they are in family members after three or four minutes they start using their mobiles and they start uh, uh, getting engaged with the social media not with each other uh, even if we uh, are here in a work group or in any